uh, when, the, when the meeting conclu uh, concludes. So thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate your time today. Um, excited to get into Brian's presentation. Before we get into Brian's presentation and I introduce Brian, um, I wanted just to take a minute and um, kind of give you a personal, personal story. So in fifth grade, my teacher labeled me the stupid kid, the kid that couldn't learn. Truthfully, I think many of my peers already knew this. He just made it official. Throughout my years in elementary school, learning was difficult. Peer interaction came nothing but naturally and making friends was even more challenging. I'll never forget the note that came to me one day at lunch recess. This was from the girl of my dreams. She was my Vanna White and she was gonna turn my letters for years to come. She asked me to be her boyfriend. I was stoked, amazed that she'd want me to be her girlfriend. Well, 30 minutes later while sitting in class, I was passed a note. Yep, the good old days of passing a piece of paper from one person to another. When I frantically opened it up, trying, not, trying to make sure my teacher didn't see it, the note said, the joke's on you. I would never be your girlfriend. In my fifth grade mind, I was a loser, an outcast, and I felt like the stupid kid that my teacher labeled me. I didn't realize until many years later that I had dyslexia, ADHD, and was an outside the box learner and thinker. I share my personal experience with you today because I know that many children with learning differences feel the very same way. This is the passion that propelled me to create Results Learning 16 years ago. Results Learning is a thriving academic coaching and tutoring organization for out-of-the-box learners. For many years, I've noticed that while we were helping students build skills to be more powerful or to be more successful in school and life, school and life, students weren't spending enough time learning about and using their strengths. But instead, they were learning how to better function in a world they weren't perfectly wired for. That's why we founded Guiding Bright Minds. Guiding Bright Minds exists to break the stigma around students with learning differences and empower each child to use and thrive in their strengths. At Guiding Bright Minds, we strive to recognize the brilliance in each mind, empower each child to use their strengths while addressing their needs so that today's diverse learners can be tomorrow's leaders. Guiding Bright, Bright Minds is building a community of champions, that is parents and educators who support and believe in students with learning differences. There'll be opportunities to join parent and educational webinars, parent universities, blog with other families and professionals, meet families through our organized social gatherings, uh, at this point over Zoom, but hopefully soon in person, they'll be able to engage with professionals and get the latest information impacting our community. So I ask you to please, please visit our website, guidingbrightminds.com, and consider becoming a champion for your child, the children you work with, or the bright minds that you support. There's no monetary cost to become a champion. Um, you'll find us again at guidingbrightminds.com, and I'll send a link after Brian's talk. I'll also send you a recording of, of this webinar for your reference and any other additional items um, that pop up that are requested throughout. Um, before I introduce Brian, please note that our next webinar, Finding Islands of Strength in Stormy Seas, presented by Craig Nippenberg, is coming up on December 1st at 6.30, and you'll get some information on that as well. So at this time, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Brian Wolf, Dr. Brian Wolf. Dr. Brian Wolf is the owner of Wolf Psychology and a licensed clinical psychologist with specialized training in the evaluation of autism spectrum disorder, dyslexia, and other learning disabilities, intellectual and executive functioning, developmental challenges, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and behavioral difficulties. Dr. Brian Wolf received his MA and PhD in child clinical psychology from the University of Denver and received a BA in psychology and sociology from Yale University. Dr. Wolf collaborates with families in developing and sustaining educational and treatment plans focused on supporting academic, cognitive, social, emotional, and behavior, behavioral needs of children's, uh, children and teenagers. I personally have known Brian for several years, including our collaboration with clients, 
uh, through our fellowship at the International Dyslexia Association Rocky Mountain Branch, and personally through having my son evaluated by one of his psychologists in his practice. So for Dr. Wolf's presentation, Finding Your Child's Superpowers Through Their Learning Disabilities, Dr. Wolf's gonna address how ADHD and dyslexia often coincide with children and teens. You will learn why that is and discover the, some of the unique superpowers that these children possess. So with that being said, Brian, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Kyle. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, I will have uh, some slides and in, in, um, you know, lecture material to start with to kind of get the ball rolling, but I'm very much looking forward to the question and answer part of this uh, conversation. That's, I think, where a lot of the, you know, good information will be, really be shared. But um, I'm going to go ahead and do uh, share screen here. Uh, there's some slides to get started. And Kyle, thank you so much for the introduction. I, You're welcome. I, I very much appreciate this opportunity to do this, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. So, let's see here. Okay. So uh, just a few uh, kind of starting points. Um, you know, when we're thinking about uh, kind of finding superpowers through learning disabilities, let's kind of discuss uh, just a little bit about what learning disabilities are and what we're talking about and some um, features of things like ADHD, dyslexia that are gonna help guide our conversation about um, the positives, the strengths, the superpowers. So, um, and I take a little bit of a different, uh, you know, kind of bent on some of these terms than, uh, you know, if you just sort of Googled it or looked at the DSM, I like to kind of think about, uh, you know, what are some of the underlying uh, features of things like ADHD, dyslexia, executive functioning uh, that we see time and time again with kids that have an evidence base. Uh, so if we think about ADHD, you know, with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you know, I, I don't really focus on the word deficit in the title too, too much. I, I like to think about um, what are some processes that are different um, in how kids with ADHD learn and, and process information. Uh, one really important concept I talk with families about all the time is this concept of hyper and hypo focusing. So as you know, uh, as just a human, uh, you generally focus more on the things you're interested in and focus less on the things you're not interested in. Pretty common human thing. Um, when people have ADHD, it's just more extreme, right? You tend to really focus in on the things you're interested in, um, often to the point where that becomes a very singular focus. Uh, maybe you're a kid and mom's saying it's time for dinner and you're like, nope, I'm focused on this thing. Uh, so you get that kind of a really strong focus on the things you're interested in or good at or feel confident in. And then hypo-focusing, really kind of zone out, tune out, feel averse to the things that are not of interest or natural to you. Um, and again, it's typical human dichotomy, ADHD makes it, makes it more extreme. Um, as you'll see when we talk later about superpowers, these are both elements that while they can cause problems at times, hyper and hyper focusing, they can absolutely be superpowers as well that we're gonna talk about um, in just a little bit. Uh, I also like to think about things like working memory and processing speed and efficiency. So um, again, if you kind of Google or think conventionally about ADHD, you think about like the hyperactivity or the kids who are kind of spaced out or whatever. But I like to think about just the, the kind of neuropsychological things happening that, that make attention or other factors harder at times. So one of this is, is a concept of called working memory, um, which is also uh, an executive function you know, it, it, that we'll talk about. And working memory is this idea of being able to kind of keep information in mind while you're operating on something. You know, Let's say you're trying to uh, you know, um, follow a multiple part instruction your, your mom gave you, but you have to keep those parts in mind while you're starting to operate on them, right? So if you're told to go upstairs, get your clothes, and you know, put them on and come back downstairs. You have to keep all of those in mind as you're going up the stairs. Otherwise you're gonna, you know, kind of start to get to your room and you're gonna mess with something or maybe put part of your clothes on and completely forget the rest. So working memory is a concept that, uh, you know, you're keeping things in mind while you're doing things. Kids with ADHD tend to struggle with this, um, you know, not for the things they're super interested in. So if you're doing Minecraft, for example, with a kid with ADHD who's really into Minecraft, they could absolutely keep all of that information in mind of how to craft something while they're working on something else. They could be very strong because that's their hyper focus. But if it's not their interest, you see this big uh, discrepancy all of a sudden, like it's very, very, very difficult to keep multiple things in mind at the same time. Um, same with uh, processing speed and efficiency. Sometimes uh, we'll have kids do something you know, in, in school or in a testing situation that's could be boring, a little repetitive, and their, their processing speed slows way down. It's just, it's harder to sustain that attention and kind of do things at a, at a typical or faster pace. Yet, again, and this is the allusion to the superpowers, is that when they are interested in something or passionate about something, 
they could be right on there and super quick about it. Maybe they're really into crafting of different sorts and to get all the different pieces together, uh, it happens really quick and efficiently because it's against their interest, it's, their, it's part of their superpower. So as you can see, my general take on ADHD is it's this balance. Like sometimes the features of ADHD are problematic given certain circumstances, sometimes they're super, um, their superpowers are very helpful under other circumstances. And then finally, um, emotion regulation, not one that often gets exactly thought of when people hear the concept of ADHD, but it's always in there. Um, kids with ADHD by and large uh, can be very um, sensitive. They can be uh, have a lot of trouble regulating emotions. I like to think sometimes about the hyper-focusing aspect of ADHD. So if a kid uh, it feels wronged in a certain way or something's unjust or they didn't get what they wanted, uh, good luck getting their focus off that, right? The emotions, the feelings, the thoughts, uh, the debate around, uh, you know, what they believe went, didn't go well for them. And so that could be extremely difficult um, in terms of regulating emotions because the hyper-focusing element is on. Um, as we'll see later, uh, being emotionally sensitive is an awesome attribute at times, right? So we'll talk about that in the superpowers section. Um, dyslexia, you know, seemingly on the surface can seem very different than ADHD. ADHD is this thing about focusing and working memory. Dyslexia is about reading and language-based learning. As we'll see, there are a lot of intersections here. So yes, dyslexia is typically called a reading disability. It involves uh, language-based learning and phonological processing elements that aren't automatic for um, kids who have it. Uh, kids without dyslexia, you know, 80, 85% of the population have a little bit of reading curriculum, can pick up on it, read naturally. Kids with dyslexia need a whole bunch of other supports in place. And, and if they don't, learn reading through other mechanisms like memorization, good verbal learning and guessing. Um, kids with dyslexia can be brilliant verbally. They can have, have the highest verbal IQs, but their reading is uh, either sort of meh to lower, and it's just it's, it's pretty discrepant. One feature I like to talk about dyslexia that doesn't always get a lot of um, attention is called automatic associative learning. Uh, so this is this idea, like if you think about what reading is, right, it's this idea that you have oral language skills in your head and you have written language on the page. You learn the code through kind of curriculum and exposure. And if you don't have dyslexia, the code becomes automatic. You just read um, at your age level, but you kind of grow along with that. If you're dyslexic, that um, automatic association doesn't pair super well. So you have great oral language skills, perhaps. Uh, you can certainly see and, 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 and see the code on the page, but that automatic association, that natural reading skill is impaired in some way. That automatic associative learning doesn't just stop at the at, the, at reading, it happens with things like math facts, it happens with things like memorizing short lists of things and so forth. So uh, so we'll often see that there can be um, some processing difficulty with dyslexia where um, kids with dyslexia kind of learn more manualized ways of, of connecting with, with concepts. So for example, they might see, you know, nine plus four on the page. And whereas a kid without dyslexia might say instantly nine plus four, the symbol means 13, a kid with dyslexia might have to be like nine, 10, 11, 12, or learn some other mechanisms to really nail down that fact and make more errors along the way because it's not automatic. So tying some of this together um, is this idea of executive functioning, right? So executive functioning uh, can be thought of a lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of people think about it in terms of like a CEO and organizing and so forth, and that's certainly part of it. But executive functioning is also a lot about regulation. So um, when you think about the emotions and behaviors and cognitive uh, you know, regulation skills, um, let's say you're out in the world and you're trying to solve a problem, a social problem you're having with a friend, a, a, a conflict, conflict you're having with your parents, uh, you're trying to get your work done and you have many things on your list, you have all these problems you have to solve day to day. We have to regulate our emotions and our behaviors and our kind of cognitive organizational skills to be able to attack and, and, and solve problems effectively. So, so executive functioning is something that kind of ties all of that together. And we see things like being able to process information, keep things in working memory, keep things kind of going in terms of uh, you know, encoding and retrieving information as part of executive functioning. So you know, that kind of brings me to the intersection slide here. So kind of what connects ADHD and dyslexia um, and what, you know, how do we understand that these, these, these two concepts together? Well, one is that we know that there's a, what's called a high comorbidity, right? So, uh, you know, co-occurrence rate. So a lot of kids with ADHD have dyslexia, a lot of kids with dyslexia have ADHD, more so than if I, in the population. So for example, if I had um, 10 kids with dyslexia in the room, um, probably about three to four of them will have ADHD. If I had 10 kids with ADHD, three or four would have dyslexia. If I took 10 kids off the street, probably one would have either condition, right? So there's just a higher chance of having both. 
there's great evidence that there's strong genetic you know, connections and correlations between these concepts. And one area that seems to connect ADHD and dyslexia are you know, executive functioning um, difficulties related to the, some of the things we've been talking about, associative learning, hyper and hyper-focusing, um, and, and the balance between uh, hyper and hyper-focusing. And then we also see that ADHD and dyslexia exacerbate each other you know, in any given moment and over time. So for example, you have a kid with dyslexia in a reading intervention. Um, we know that kids with dyslexia, we know that kids with ADHD can kind of shy away from things that are harder for them, that are, that are um, you know, kind of require more sustained uh, mental focus. And so now you're trying to do an intervention with a kid with dyslexia in an area that's harder for them, like reading fluency, their ADHD will often kick in. So we'll, find, we'll hear from tutors all the time that, you know, it's a 30 minute session, a 60 minute session, I'm getting 40% out of them, I'm getting 30% out of them. Um, it takes a good tutor to keep it going and active and engaging and take breaks. Um, but it's hard. It's hard when you have both and they, they, they exacerbate each other, um, you know, in the moment and over time. So if I'm out there and I'm a second grader and I have ADHD and dyslexia um, and over the course of the days and weeks and months of school, I'm just, you know, uh, everyone's trying to teach me to read and trying to give me all the sort of supports and, and, uh, and reading intervention and so forth. And the ADHD just keeps it less efficient, less efficient over time. I'm just not gaining as much from the intervention because the ADHD is there and perhaps it's not treated and it's really impacting things. Um, so, so, you know, you get less benefit over second grade, third grade, and it kind of keeps things um, a bit harder. Now, um, you know, we're going to talk about the strengths and superpowers of ADHD and dyslexia, but also, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be some conversation about, you know, what do you do if you have these conditions? What are ways to help? And, um, you know, and what I like to think of the kid as a whole system, right? They're not defined by ADHD or dyslexia or both. But if you make any inroads in any one area, it impacts the whole system positively. So if you sort of if reading gets much better due to intervention, then there'll be less kind of ADHD symptomatology when future reading happens because the reading is more automatic. Or if you treat ADHD, let's say with executive functioning coaching or with medication or whatever, um, that can make the whole reading intervention go much better because the kid's able to engage more and the reading uh, grows at a faster pace. So um, while these two conditions can exacerbate each other, you can also kind of make inroads in any one and makes the whole system um, better. So thinking about superpowers, um, I like to think about hyper and hypo focusing as superpowers, right? So um, I say this to every parent who calls, and if you've been a parent I've talked to, hopefully I've said this to you, that you know if you have a kid with ADHD and they're finding the thing of interest and when they get into their careers, they'll be the person to be hired, right? Like that is, you want the person with ADHD doing the thing that they're passionate and interested about to be on your team. Absolutely, because they're going to be the ones who are into it, they're hyper focused on it, they can um, really engage in the material and, and be outside of the box thinkers about it, you know, it's not just that they hyper focus on certain details, but they kind of like that deep into the topic area of interest. Um, hypo focusing can be also a superpower because if you think about it, if you kind of like are something happening in the room and you're not that interested and you're kind of zoned out a little bit, and you can harness that energy, you're thinking broadly, right? You may be thinking about your next big idea. You're thinking creatively. Um, you may be in a social situation. And while everybody's sort of into the moment of the conversation, you might be kind of just, just, just one step removed back and thinking, what's the dynamic here? What's going on? You kind of have that a little bit of a tendency toward observer status, which in, in, in moderate doses can be really helpful because you're kind of taking that step back. At the same time, you may be using the hyper-focusing where you may have a, a, you know, you may be interacting with one friend and they're talking about one thing and you're really kind of engaged in what they're doing and you're seeing the emotion behind it. You're seeing the broader picture and not just what they're putting out there. And so kids with ADHD, despite all the talk about social skills groups and needs, for, which is part of it, they can be, once again, they find their people, they find their person, their best friend, they could be the best, best friends. They could be really into kind of that interaction. Um, maybe as long as they learn those kind of skills around not being as impulsive or, um, or you know, making sure that they're taking the time to use these superpowers, right? So sometimes just highlighting these superpowers exist and getting some support, counseling, coaching around, you know, how to harness that energy. Kids with ADHD can certainly be, um, you know, really strong friends. Um, across, you know, ADHD dyslexia, uh, you know, in learning disabilities, we do see tendencies toward, um, you know, emotional sensitivity. So what happens, uh, part of the reason I discussed earlier with ADHD, maybe kids are, or people are um, hyper-focused on negative emotions or on the emotions of others around them, and it can really sensitize our systems and get into that fight or flight mode. Um, but it's also a superpower, right? Because if you are sensitive 
um, to your environment, you're sensitive to other people, you can really pick up on subtleties. Um, and you could really be like the most fun kid in the group, right? Like, I mean, times have I heard that we have clients that have ADHD and like they are absolutely fun, right? They can be the light, life of the party, having a really great time, you know, depending on other factors related to anxiety and so forth. Um, but again, it, there's that balance of like, yes, and how do you pay attention to other social cues when things maybe start to go awry or there's something of that sort. So it's a, it's a balancing act, just like anything involved um, in development. Would you see tendencies toward um, really nice divergent kind of thinking and reasoning skills, right? With, with kids who have ADHD and learning disabilities that, um, you know, in part because their brain has had to operate a bit differently than, than other kids. It's a little bit harder to kind of just fit the sort of rote way that things are, are taught in a lot of environments. And so kids have had to come up with coping strategies and different ways to approach things and different strategies to accomplish the same things that their peers did. And maybe it took more time and it took more angst and energy and, and battles at home, but they kind of learn this way to, to you know, think outside the box and outside you know, the conventional way because the conventional way doesn't always work for them. And that leads me to sort of the kind of final point about resilience that you, know, you have um, like with anything, if kids have physical disabilities or, you know, just the very act of, of living through and gaining and, and being able to ask for help and being able to see, you know, changes in terms of, you know, growth and so forth, um, but also being able to take hits and failure and move from them, big aspects of, of building resilience. And, and I often see, um, you know, kids that we've seen in this practice and teens over time, and uh, it is just one of the number one uh, you know, wonderful reasons I do this job is that you can kind of see with the support, with the tears, with the growth, um, we get these really awesome resilient kids over time that become become the Kyle Feingold. So, because, you know, they uh, they take those uh, those hits, those uh, those those incidents, and 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 eventually, even though it's hard in the moment, grow from them, um, become successful uh, entrepreneurs, and 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 so forth. So, um, you know, uh, so yeah, I mean, so that's that's by and large the um, Oh, sorry, I have one more bullet point there. Um, but that's by and large the, the presentation side of it. I'm not even sure in the timing here. But I guess the last thing is that, you know, if kids do come through a practice like mine or, or go through IEP testing or whatever and get diagnosed or identified with ADHD, dyslexia, you know, there, there's a lot to consider there. You know, what, what's impairing, what's success, you know, how do we sort of parlay the strengths and superpowers to true success and like that. But it, it's just one little slice of their brain. Honestly, there's intelligence, personality, social skills, um, interest, charm, you know, all those other things that, 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 that define the multiple levels of identity define who we are. So I don't ever, ever want someone to say, you know, ADHD or dyslexia defines me um, in its entirety. They're just aspects of how we, how we think and how we do things. And again, um, could be absolute superpowers and strengths for, uh, for many people. So... Kyle, I think that's the kind of formal part. I'm looking forward to more of the Q&A, but I wanted to see if there was anything you wanted me to add or are we doing on time? Doing great. We're doing great. You're, we're a little ahead of schedule, so oh, good work. Did I talk a little fast? <laughs> I might have done that. <laughs> um, so yeah, please, at this point in time, if you have any questions, drop them either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, first question that, that we have today is, can ADHD come on with situations? So this person's 12-year-old son had to, has dyslexia, but hasn't shown any signs of ADHD until this year, noticed by his tutor and um, his mom. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll read, I'll, uh, yes and no. <laughs> so ADHD as, a, uh, as an entity doesn't sort of come on with situations, but the presentation of symptoms absolutely can. So for example, um, you can have a person who has an underlying neuropsychology of ADHD. It's part of how their brain is structured. Um, but you don't see the symptoms or impairment um, until some point later in life, right? Perhaps, um, you know, they are, you know, they're, they're bright, they're in a good school system, their parents are helpful, they're, they're able to kind of, um, you know, they're people pleasers, they don't show that. So there are a lot of kids where you just don't see it, you know? If we did some careful testing, we might be able to find it in, in a clinic setting and be able to kind of have some, do some sensitive testing around it. But we don't tend to see kids for that kind of testing unless it presents, you know, a sort of a difficulty. So yes, there comes a point when the social demands, when the academic demands, when the executive function demands go up, that this level of uh, 
attention executive function that the kid has been exhibiting uh, starts to kind of lag behind the, the demands. This is demands kind of placed on them. And so while they're growing, the, the demands are going up faster. And when that discrepancy appears, then we start to say, I wonder if there's an underlying intentional ADHD kind of issue here. Yeah, and I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just add one thing, Brian. That's, yeah, please do. We see lots of kids that I think, think teachers um, or just people in our lives sometimes kind of misdiagnose a child. Lots of times we see kids that don't have ADHD, but rather they have a deficit with their executive functioning. And in a lot of cases, they can, they can appear very similar. Um, so I'm not certainly sure if this is the case in your particular, um, with your particular 12 year old, but um, we see that quite a bit where organization, time management, planning, um, the ability to prioritize and initiate, particularly in this learning environment that we're in today, um, kind of rise to the surface when things become more independent uh, and more difficult. And that a lot of times that's kind of a standalone executive functioning challenge as opposed to ADHD. Um, so Brian, the next question was, what's the best way to get your child screened for ADHD? Mm -hmm. Great question. There's a few ways to do it. Um, one, is, the, the simplest way is to go to your pediatrician or family doctor. They will do kind of a, a brief interview, uh, you know, kind of meet with the kid for just kind of the length of a normal doctor appointment, and then typically have you um, as parents and then a couple of teacher or two do some questionnaires. Um, it's sort of a, a classic screener um, approach, right? So screeners, um, if they come out positive, they're usually pretty meaningful. If they come out negative, it may not mean that much. You may have to do some further testing. Um, the difficulty with screeners is like the way I talked about ADHD with associative learning and working memory, those things are not really assessed very directly in questionnaires that doctor's offices will give. They're usually going to be like diagnostic checklists, you know, related to attention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. So you can absolutely miss kind of a fair amount of kids who may really be truly experiencing ADHD. Um, so if you go that route and uh, it's still feeling like you're, you're left wanting, you're not quite getting there, um, you tend to go to a psychologist like myself. Um, you know, we do again, extensive testing in this area, in office, questionnaires, parents, teachers, tutors, um, so we can get to the kind of, you know, heart of it all. Thanks, Brad. Uh, the only other route is school, right? So schools, uh, you know, develop 504 plans and IEPs all the time for kids who are exhibiting attention difficulties. Um, schools don't diagnose. Uh, they can just identify issues and try to provide some um, accommodations or support. So it's it's not quite a diagnose, diagnostic process, but it is something that, you um, you know, public schools are, 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 can look at. Great. Thank you. So our next question is, so um, Junico writes, my 10 year old son is super focused on video games. He gets so emotional and angry when he needs to stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's been trying to introduce him to other activities he might be interested in, but he really gets bored of it pretty quickly. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> you haven't, yes, <laughs> I can tell you what I've tried. Uh, I mean, I, it's hard for me these days to, I blur professional and personal because I have a 10 year old boy and has ADHD, is focused on video games. Um, so I, I, I hear you that it is a tricky one. Um, you know, I, what we generally advise in, in my practice and, and I try to you know do this at home as best is, you know, just thinking about, it. It's not rocket science, think about limits, right? So if you have, let's say, a daily limit of whatever makes sense for your family, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, whatever it is, I'm not judgmental about it, but you have that limit. And, uh, and then sometimes what you can do is say, hey, like if we do this other activity, we go for this walk, we do these Legos, this crafts, whatever, um, even though it's boring what we do it for X amount of time, maybe we can earn a little bit more on top of that, right? Kind of feed into that interest because I, I'm learning over time that, you know, video games aren't aren't the devil. They are they're they're a strong interest for you know the hyper focused strong interest for a lot of kids, especially that have ADHD. And as long as you're kind of screening the general you know violence content and whatever of games, you know I, I'm not a big fan of saying like no screens is is terrible for kids across the board. But you may want to say there's like a non contingent screen time and contingent screen time. So non contingent is kind of what 
you know, what a kid might say to their dog if I'm right now. It's like, it's kind of what they expect day to day in their general routine, unless they lose it for some important reason. But maybe there's some 15, 20, 30 minutes on top of that they can do for doing the extra activity with you. And usually that, um, you know, you, you add in that little extrinsic reward to do that activity, but they get something out of it, especially if you're doing that activity with them, like doing a craft with mom, they're going outside for a walk with mom, they're doing, uh, you know, whatever. Um, we do a lot of um, just dance and uh, we sports at our house to get activity, but kind of still on the screen, but it keeps them active. So that's kind of one thought on that. Awesome. And speaking of we, uh, we have a, <laughs> a question is, you know, we, um, and this question actually comes from my wife, so I'll just ask it personally. Um, <laughs> So our son is seven years old and all of his friends have Minecraft. Yeah, uh, we've been holding off um, on Minecraft. He's been asking for it for the holidays, um, but he does play Wii. So it, do you see a particular age, Brian, in which video games should be introduced? And what's your overall thoughts? And you, you talked a little bit about this, but what are your overall thoughts around kids with ADHD and video games? Yeah. This is a tough one. Um, and I think uh, the answer intersects with a lot of people's kind of values on the concept and what they're, you know, and, and every kid's a little different about how obsessed they get or not at different points in their reactions when video games go away. Generally speaking, you have ADHD and you're into video games, you're going to be super into video games, hyper focusing, right? Like, and of course, the video games don't make that any easier. They are dopamine rich environments. I don't care if it's Minecraft or, or any other game. Uh, you play that game and you want it more, you want more, you want more out of it. So it, it is a it is a thing to consider. I think if, again, they're being utilized in the context of an overall system in your family and not just sort of, you know, like, hey, I'm just going to kind of let the video games just, you know, they can do what they want or I'm going to, you know, just restrict it when I, like, if it's sort of part of a of a system again, like maybe there's some non-contingent time, contingent time, uh, you know, in order to earn the video games, or you have to get their chores done or whatever it is. I think it could be fine, um, but they have to, you know, the kids with ADHD have to learn that skill of switching focus, right? So kind of switching from one thing to another, those transitions. And so if it can be utilized as an opportunity, you know, to say, hey, if you switch off the video game without a problem, you get a point toward X, right? Like you can kind of always build that stuff in, uh, so the learning like it. Like the ant, like just because they can't do something well doesn't mean we take it all the way. That's not a great lesson. Nor does it mean we just cave and let them do it all the time. But we take these things as opportunities to teach the skills that they're struggling in. Is awesome. the ideal parenting strategy. But again, sometimes you're gonna do other things. <laughs> good advice. Good advice. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is the best way to motivate children with dyslexia and and dyscalculia to learn and give it their best shot? Yeah, well, that's, I think every question is gonna be the million dollar <laughs> question. I just feel like these are just such common things. Um, can I just repeat it again, just to make sure I get in the wording right yeah, here, Kyle. Sure. So what is the best way to motivate children with dyslexia and dyscalculia to learn and give it their best shot? Yeah, yeah. Well, multi-pronged answer. I mean, one is to just to take that big step back and say, are they getting the broad support they need for that issue, right? So um, if you have, a, Generally speaking, if you have conditions that are undertreated, uh, don't get enough intervention, uh, you're gonna have more and more difficulty getting the motivation because they're not maybe learning the skills they need and becomes more and more aversive for them. So the kind of biggest slice of the answer to the question is making sure the support systems are in place. You have perhaps an evaluation done, you have counseling, you have school supports that they're getting the kind of, you know, the best starting point. Right, because if you don't do all of those things, then it's just like you're asking them to do something in their disability area, and that's always going to be really, really difficult. Um, so, but even if all of that's set up and you're and you're all doing your best, the teacher team, the parents, um, you're still going to hit motivational issues because of hypo focusing. It's just it, it's still aversive. It's still hard for them, so they want to kind of back off. Um, I mean, there's a few ways to think about it. I mean, one is like I kind of said earlier in the other example is that extrinsic reward model, like. You know, if you're being asked to do something that's really difficult for you, you probably expect something and a little bit something in return as sort of a, you know, to a sign that, hey, this is something that's hard, and, but I'm over, I'm persevering, I'm overcoming it. So like in my house, we have like point systems that can be traded in for various things. So, you know, sometimes just that little bit of a, of a carrot can really help. Um, I really like when um, 
you know, when, when the thing that you're trying to get a kid to do that's harder for them can be made interpersonal, right? So a lot of like the, you know, hey, you have to read this, just go read this, uh, it can be hard. But if you're maybe sitting with them or you're taking turns reading it or you're doing something within reason to support their engagement in the math and the reading, um, just that interpersonal connection alone can really make a really substantial difference we found too. So um, and that could be more of that intrinsic connection, like it feels safer and warmer to do the thing I'm like because mom's with me, dad's with me, and they're caring and they're thoughtful about it. And they're not on my back, right? It's very easy to, to be the micromanager and the nitpicker about it, but you know, as much as you can to be the cheerleader and support um, as it is an area that's difficult for them. And I, I like that advice about the, the trusting relationship. The yeah. other thing I might mention there too is um, assistive technology. We, we used to call it assistive technology. Now I just call it technology because everybody's using it more and more, but things like Absolutely. Um, speech to text, right? We have a lot of kiddos with this kind of profile that have amazing verbal skills. Um, so using those verbal skills and allowing them to dictate their papers, for example, in school, and then go back and go through the proofreading process that every child has to do, but really using their strengths um, to be able to put their best foot forward and gain confidence, and then, and then going through that, that process of editing and finalizing, for example, on unwritten work. Mm -hmm. um, this is fun. Uh, yeah, great. great. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> All right, so I have a multiple prong question here. Um, All right, so I'm ready. My working memory is engaged. Here we go. <laughs> All right, it, it better be. Actually, I'll read along. I'll read along. I love that. All right. <laughs> Often it seems like my eight-year-old has forgotten that he's learned what he has learned with reading, a regression of sorts. He's been in tutoring all summer for dyslexia, learned great things, but now the school has started, that school has started, he is encountering more demands. He seems to be forgetting what he knows. Is this part of, of the automatic association? Uh, yeah. Are you, you want me to read one? the rest? Yeah, uh, yeah. Go, okay. go ahead. Let's get it. How can I help him remember the things he's learned and is he learning new material? Um, also, is OG really the best resource for helping students with dyslexia? And how long does it take to really see the impact of such tutoring? Also, how also um, he does also struggle with memorizing his multiplication facts. Any great tips on how to help with this? He has a diagnosis of ADHD and dyslexia. Uh, I'll answer all of that, uh, but shove the OG question. Uh, maybe Kyle, you can answer that a little bit better. Uh, whether it's the exact best resource, I mean, it's an evidence-based one, but I'll, I'll speak more to the broad concepts here. Um, so, uh, you know, the answer is. Uh, it's tricky. So one way to think about, uh, let's say just take dyslexia, or really anything where you have a, a, a harder time, a weakness in, right? Uh, but let's take dyslexia. Uh, I think to think of dyslexia, not only as like a kind of deficit in reading skills or something, but there's an inconsistency. So I will talk to many, many parents who will say, um, yeah, you know, uh, there was like a week there where we had him read out loud and he was spot on. I didn't even remember he had dyslexia. He was just like reading at his level and it was, he nailed it and everybody started to question the diagnosis. And then, you know, the next three weeks went by and it was like he was guessing at every word. Everything was difficult again. Uh, what is this? Is he faking it? Like, what, how can you do really well one week and really poorly the next week? Um, so part of it is because, you know, the because of the automatic, you know, automatic associative learning, right? So let's say, again, you are a person with dyslexia and, and the decoding on the page is not an automatic process. You've uh, learned some other skills of memorization and guessing and so forth to get yourself started. You're starting to get no Gs, so you're starting to kind of take a step back and learn the building blocks. But again, your brain is wired in such a way that it's not just going to kind of hit in a natural format easily, right? Maybe not without a, a lot of intervention over time. Um, so what controls more the quality of what's happening with reading is other factors like did the kid get, get good sleep? What kind of mood are they in? Are they in a, you know, or, or did they eat well? So if I like to say if all pistons are firing and they, they slept well and they ate well and they're engaged in the material, they may rip, they may rip, like be using all their kind of pistons firing and reading pretty well. The telltale sign of something like dyslexia is that when some of those factors start to not be present, they didn't sleep as well, they didn't eat as well, and they're kind of bad mood, it kind of disintegrates a bit. And all of a sudden it becomes a lot harder to kind of maintain uh, the fluency because it's not automatic. You know, they're, not, they're not exerting all possible energy to do well. So we see this in things like, you know, 
they learn certain concepts and they were there and they were present with the tutoring, they got the concept and then days go by and it's not automatic still, it is harder for them. So it, it kind of just gives us that sympathy and that empathy too, that this is hard, you know, it's like training, it, it, it's like training. It's like, you have to sort of keep up the, the practice and keep up the practice over time. Now, do they need to, do all kids with dyslexia need intervention forever? No, but they probably do need to maintain some form of practice and healthy habits around the areas that are difficult for them so they can maintain their progress. It's just one of those aspects of having a learning disability is that it, it we don't expect it to just become automatic, but it gets better with more intervention over time with caring providers, accommodation supports. So um, I think that's my broad answer. The only other thing about memorizing things, um, the basic evidence out there says like memorizing the multiplication facts and so forth is that, um, you know, there's not like a great computer pro, like there was a lot of promise in certain things like lumosity and so forth, like we can really improve our working memory. It seems that we can really practice in certain areas. So if you drilled, you know, the five times tables with your kid and did it every day and you know, electronically or always for a long time, he would get it. Like you can, we can, we can, you can strengthen those memorization associations, but it still means that the next thing that you're going to be teaching has to be sort of kind of reapproach that we can't necessarily get that automatic associative learning better across the board in all areas. It's like we have to do some some skill and drill, some mnemonics to really um, get good in, in particular areas. So Kyle, does that seem to kind of hit yeah, those questions? Yeah, I agree. And in, in terms of, you know, just directly in terms of Orton Gillingham, the Orton Gillingham question. Um, Orton Gillingham is what they call a structured multi-sensory reading approach. And it was kind of the original, it's it's really the Orton Gillingham is really kind of the founder of the structured multisensory reading approach that's been proven to be most successful with students with dyslexia and other language-based learning difficulties that impact reading. Um, but there are lots of different programs uh, that are multisensory structured approaches as well that have that have really the methodology of Orton Gillingham built in, some of those key fundamentals such as the Wilson Reading Program, Linda Mood Bell. Um, there's a local organization here called um, Horton Gillingham International um, that teaches a program. There's lots of different programs out there like Take Flight as well that have those same approaches. They're all slightly different. Um, some, many of those approaches are what they call mastery-based approaches. So you have to master one concept before another and they're very lockstep. And for some kids, those are the amazing approaches. Other approaches really, really rely on very skilled uh, reading therapists, shall we say, so that the, the instructor or the tutor can really understand your child and hit those specific areas um, that, that, they may be, that they may have some deficits in, but really recognize those strengths and put those all together and go at a, at a pace that's, that's most appropriate with your child. So there's different approaches but they all really do come back to the core foundation of the Orton-Gillingham methodology. All right, um, here's another question. What makes someone qualify for an IEP or, excuse me, for an IEP for ADHD instead of a 504? Yeah, um, taking one step back. So IEP, Individualized Education Program, uh, it's a, kind of mechanism in public school settings to get uh, kind of both intervention and service goals for certain areas, as well as accommodations. 504 plan uh, is uh, basically an accommodations plan. So you have some kind of a documented disability with impairment at school and you get things like extra time on tests and extra breathing room or on assignments and access to you know, different kinds of technology that, uh, that you require to be able to access the curriculum. So an IEP is often thought to be sort of um, kind of a higher level in a sense. You have all the accommodations you need, plus you get reading intervention, writing intervention, whatever, whatever. Um, what determines whether you get an IP or 504 plan? Many things. Uh, part of it is how squeaky of a parent you are. Part of it is whether you have a, an advocate or a psychologist at your side. Part of it is what they need. So in a pure sense of the term, you know, if kids can access the curriculum and they have ADHD using a 504 plan for accommodations and they don't need you know, more intervention to be able to kind of maintain. They could just kind of get the extra time on tests or get the 
um, assistive technology or breaks built into their schedule, then they'll probably just have a 504 plan. Um, if that 504 plan essentially isn't enough and they really need uh, much more development of skills in certain areas like executive functioning supports or emotion regulation um, in order to be successful or, or even just be able to be at school, then they might qualify for an IEP. Typically an IEP language would be under the category of other health impairment which for ADHD falls. Um, there's not really an ADHD category in an IEP, but um, I, I've seen it go every which way and, and it sort of depends on the school and the parents and how much you know, discussion goes on and really the level of impairment for the student. And one other thing, like if kids have ADHD and dyslexia, sometimes they'll get an IEP for the dyslexia part, you know, they get reading intervention and so forth. And then within that IEP framework, then they also get executive functioning ADHD support too. So, uh, so sometimes the IEP is sort of broader than, than the main area that they're focusing on, which might be reading or writing or math or something. Okay. So here's, a, here's an interesting question. Um, my son switched to Denver Academy this past year due to difficulties at school the past two years. He's doing awesome. Started taking Ritalin, a huge and difficult decision for us, last January while at his previous school. He did well on it and it helped him some for school. But now that he, he's at DA, he no longer uses Ritalin. He doesn't want it or need it and he's doing great. Can you talk a little bit about the phenomenon, not necessarily Denver Academy itself, but the kind of dichotomy of seeing a child in one environment yeah. thrive without medicine and then the other struggle? It's a beautifully written question. I love it. Um, yes, I can talk about that. So, you know, we think about, again, the, the whole kid, right? You have all these different neuropsychological things going on, difficulties, working memory, attention. But like I said earlier, there, it all of it interacts with the environment, right? So, uh, I like to think of the example of the kid with ADHD living on a jungle island with no responsibilities. Definitely doesn't need Ritalin, right? Like can be free, uh, not a lot of you know demands placed in them that require sustained attention for things that aren't of interest and so forth. Um, and so uh, you can think of lots of environments in which kids with different kinds of quote unquote conditions don't really need anything, right? Now you take the modern world, the real world, and they're in public schools, private schools, whatever. Um, they may diff need different levels of support medication, inter, you know, behavioral interventions, depending on the environment. So if you're in an environment where, uh, you know, yeah, it's it, it, traditional learning, uh, they, they, the, the primary teacher understands to some extent learning disabilities, but not a ton. There's 25 kids in the class or so. That might be really hard for a kid with ADHD to maintain. So maybe that Ritalin really supports that ability to kind of organize uh, their neuropsychology and to be able to focus on the most relevant details, which is usually the teacher talking in the lecture or something like that. Then you switch them over to an environment where you get much broader support. You get embedded executive functioning support. You get um, uh, even just a validation because more kids are like you and you get comfortable in that realm. Um, and it may be that those other, that, that physiological medication support that you need in one environment just becomes less relevant or less important than another. Sometimes I've seen kids switch environments that are much more successful and they, their dose goes down or, but some kids it, it's irrelevant. They need a medication no matter where they are. And it's just case by case, but absolutely these things interact with the environment and, and the more understanding and intervention and support in an environment, um, you know, the better and less likely they might need a multitude of interventions. Awesome. Right. All right, so with one in five children being diagnosed with dyslexia and the greater and great acknowledgement of neurodiverse learners. How do you see education evolving? What has to be different for schools to serve students today and also to be able to afford, afford evolving needs in education? Debbie, you're on with these questions. Nice job. <laughs> um, let me think about that for a second. I'll have a gut answer on this one. Let's see. Education development to be different for schools to serve students. Can I just yeah. go ahead, Brian? Uh, uh, go ahead, Kyle. I have a thought, but you go no, first. Go ahead. You first. All right, fine. Um, I mean, broadly speaking, we think about this with not just dyslexia, ADHD, but also kids on the autism spectrum. Also, you know, kids who have uh, really diverse, you know, intellectual learning profiles. Um, I mean, the sort of concept that, you know, and I don't think too many schools live under the concept that, you know, there's, there's literally one way to teach things. I mean, I've seen, broadly speaking, and for all the downsides of the common core, like I see the general tendency for people to try to think about diversifying, differentiating, you know, having multiple ways to solve problems. 
um, and so forth that being out there. I think the problem is that um, it doesn't always sort of play out in the real world. Like we have this concept that, yes, we'll have 25 kids in the class, we're gonna differentiate, we're gonna, but they, they can't, you know, in public school settings and, and even private school settings, like there's not enough universal testing and, and a really good point to really get a, a fine grained analysis of every learning profile. Now take Denver Academy, they do exactly what I'm saying. They do require uh, testing in advance so they have, they can develop a learning profile so they can individualize better for kids. So that's a really nice format and maybe why DA has worked so well. Um, not for all kids, but for, you, for your kid and many of them. Um, but in the public school setting, I mean, I would think it would have to be, there had to be an approach of better and more consistent testing across the board to really understand all these diverse learning profiles because kids don't always put it out there. It's kind of hard to access and understand sometimes, um, you know, just for sort of casual teacher and learner. So I would say one way to evolve education in this regard is to have just better evaluation, better testing, and not just for kids who are identified as having problems after many iterations of, of failures, but universal. And not just like what's their reading level, what's their writing level, but what's their learning profile looking like, I think would be would make a huge difference in understanding and being able to accommodate neurodiverse learners. This is one of probably many answers, but Kyle, what are your thoughts? You know, for me, when I look at how do I see education needing to evolve, I guess I'm changing the question a little bit, but, um, you know, I feel like strength-based learning is, is what we need to be doing a lot of, um, particularly for for the kinds of kids that we're talking about today. And that's you know really shifting the dichotomy of we go to this subject, you know, these are the subjects we teach, these are how we teach them. And every school varies a little bit, but putting more time during the day where kids are using their strengths to be successful. Because at the end of the day, the way I see it is students need confidence, they need self-esteem, and they need belief in themselves. And if they have those things, they're gonna be able to go out in the real world and the right skills. They're gonna be, be able to go out after school into the real world and be amazingly successful. As Brian referenced, you take a child with ADHD, for example, and you get them in a place with something that they're really good at, they're gonna be the best. There's gonna be no better. But it, it would be, it's kind of a shame when I look at today, a lot of the stories that we hear about very successful people or famous people and the challenges they went through, not unlike myself in, in, in school. Um, and they have to go through so many different things to get there. And yes, as Brian talked about, there's definitely value in that. But in many cases, we're crushing kids along the way. And so if we could find a better balance of using strengths in schools um, and really developing our strengths as well as working on those areas for development, we're gonna have more well-rounded kids much with much better mental health and ready for the challenges that a diverse world um, has for them. I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, all right. So here's another question that came in the chat. Um, so since our son's diagnosis in second grade, we were told that his dyslexia and dysgraphia are, are his superpowers. He has worn his learning differences like a badge of honor. However, moving into middle school, we've noticed that he's starting to feel embarrassed about his learning differences. Um, for me, as a grown up with dyslexia, do you have any advice to pass along to students or kids who may be struggling with owning who they are in school and in life? That is a great question, Liz. Um, so I think part of it comes back to recognizing your child, recognizing his strengths. Because at the end of the day, when he's in school with his peers, he's operating in areas for a lot of the day where the, the more difficult, the older he gets, um, the more difficult some of these rote type of processes and learning may become for him. So really helping him thrive in his strengths, find those strengths, um, and finding the appropriate balance um, as much as you can in school, but certainly outside of school with intervention and strength building whether around his interests um, are gonna be huge. So if my advice to him would be to find his strengths and spend lots of time outside of the school, outside of the school day in his strengths. So he really knows them and understands them. And when he sits and looks in his class and his peers, maybe somebody who's really reading really fast and cruising through tests and getting good grades where he has to take more time um, and it's more difficult for him to get even a B or a C, 
that he knows, yeah, this is more difficult for me, but man, when I get in this area, I'm the man, you know, I can do whatever, whatever's thrown at me. So everybody has strengths and challenges and helping him find his strength, I think is gonna help him realize the amazing person, the amazing kid he is today. All right. Well, that being said, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, let me see if I can find one more question here. Um, here's one, that, Brian, that you kind of addressed, but it'd be good to say again. Um, do, do usually dyslexia and ADHD go together? My daughter was diagnosed with dyslexia, and while not formally diagnosed with ADHD, she did have some of the characteristics, including being tired and unable to focus. She's taking medication for ADHD, even though not formally diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So do ADHD and, and dyslexia usually go together? Um, they very often go together. So, uh, you know, for different um, reasons of genetics and, and so forth, they're, uh, they are very commonly co-occurring. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that your daughter takes medication means that she actually was diagnosed. So, you know, the prescribing doctor has to put a diagnosis in the box to be able to do something like that. Doesn't mean she went through a, you know, full evaluation process, but that's fine. I mean, sometimes kids, uh, like I said at the very beginning of this, there could be a screener, you go to your pediatrician, you fill out a questionnaire or two, your teacher does, it shows enough signs of ADHD, maybe you do take medication and things improve. Like that is a very fine model of ADHD identification, diagnosis, treatment. Uh, not everybody has to do a, a full-blown psychoeducational or neuropsych evaluation. Um, but yes, they do commonly co-occur. And, um, and again, like I said, another point, ideally treating, let's say ADHD can make a difference in sort of, you know, reading, uh, you know, kind of uh, taking and reading intervention and, and um, pushing forward in your academics and, and other areas, so. Awesome. Well, Brian, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. It's been awesome having you here. Really, really yeah. appreciate it. This was and, a lot uh, of Brian, fun. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you had fun. Um, and Brian is a charter member of Guiding Bright Minds um, and our uh, really a charter member in our professional side. And so we encourage you to Again, visit our website, I'll send out a link. Uh, become a champion for your child and for this movement of strength-based, uh, strength-based, not only education, but strength-based, um, really the strength-based movement, right? And really help change the perception of children with learning differences. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, really appreciate it. And hopefully you'll be able to join us for our next webinar on December 1st at 6.30 with Craig Nippenberg. Well, everybody has a wonderful day. Brian, yeah, one, one, one quick thing, if anybody um, ever just wants to talk about their own kid, personal situation, get any kind of guidance, I, I do that regularly. I don't only take calls from people who wanna schedule services. I talk with families all the time about just, um, yeah, tell me about your, your story and your kid's story and uh, why don't you try this or call this group or do this, or you know, come in and see us for counseling or or uh, evaluation, just depends on the situation. So I'm always open to, to emails and phone calls. And awesome. and you'll share the contact info, Kyle? I will, I will. Okay. I will, awesome. I will do it as a follow-up. Everybody will get a follow-up email this evening. And if you have any other questions, again, Brian, thank you for kindness. Feel free to reach out to Brian or myself. And uh, we hope everybody has a fabulous day. And if you have a little time to go out and enjoy this nice weather. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, Kyle. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye.